Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West, Seattle-based medical oncologist and founder and CEO of GRACE, the global resource for advancing cancer education. Let's continue with our Highlights in Lung Cancer in 2011 program, produced by GRACE in partnership with the Longevity Foundation and featuring Dr. Jared Weiss from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. After focusing in earlier parts of his presentation on targeted therapy and new molecular targets, this session will focus on options for a broader population, specifically lung cancer screening and the treatment of elderly patients with advanced lung cancer. Moving on to an advance for smoking lung cancer. We've seen that we exploited the weakness that we have in the non-smoking lung cancer, its genetic simplicity. Well, the major weakness of smoking lung cancer is that it's preventable. To my mind, the biggest thing that we can do to target smoking lung cancer is to help people to quit smoking before they ever get a lung cancer. And unfortunately, I don't think that we had any advances in smoking cessation that are worthy of a best of talk 2011. However, what we did have was a screening study for high-risk smoking patients that I think was a very real advance and very, very much worthy of conversation in this talk, competing perhaps even for the leading advance of 2011. For years, as a backdrop to this, we have tried to get this kind of data. For years, we've done studies of sputum cytology, and we've done studies of chest x-rays, looking to find lung cancer early and use that finding to save lives. And those studies uniformly failed. Well, enter CT scanning, a new technology. This study took 53,476 high-risk subjects, and they defined high risk as age 55 or older, 30 pack years of smoking history, and either currently smoking or having quit within the past 15 years. And they took this group that was felt to be at particularly high risk of lung cancer and randomized people to the chest x-ray that I told you doesn't work that well or the new CT scans. And they scanned at three time points at study entry, one year after, and one year after that. Here's the bottom line data. At the top here, you can see that the CT detected more cancers than the chest x-rays alone. And at the bottom, you can see that that actually saved lives. This is a curve of lung cancer death, and you can clearly see that the low-dose CT arm did better than the chest x-ray arm. Well, how big was the advantage? 354 patients in the CT arm died compared to 442 with chest x-ray. So on an absolute basis, 88 lives were saved, translating to a 20% relative reduction in lung cancer mortality. There are some really important caveats to this. First are the people who were entered. Most of the people screened in this study were 55 to 64. Younger patients than 55 were excluded, and the elderly were underrepresented. The patients were mostly white. There was a possible, if not probable, healthy volunteer bias, which means that patients who are healthier and more likely to benefit from an intervention were more likely to enter the study. And you had to have at least 30 pack years of smoking history. I have many patients who either have never picked up a cigarette or have a smoking history somewhere between zero and 30 pack years, and this data does not address them. There's more to say. First, there were only three rounds of screening here, and if the cancer found trailed off as time passed in the study, this would make a lot of sense to screen only three times. But that's actually not what happened at all. In the first year of the study, we found 3.8% lung cancer, and by the final year, there was 5.2%, meaning there was no trail off. That raises the question of should we be screening at year four, at year five, or even for life? And I think biologically, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, there are some cases of lung cancer that are slow growing that you can follow over imaging for a few years and see there. But most lung cancer is very rapidly growing. And what that means is that at the time point that the cancer was detected, if you had a crystal ball and looked back in time, what you would see is that the cancer hasn't been there that long in the average patient. And at the time from becoming one bad cell to a clinically evident problem lung cancer is typically very short, probably less than a year in many, many patients. And that's probably why you see no trail off here and why many of us talking about starting CT screening programs are talking about annual screening and not just three scans. And there's those numbers just enlarged a bit for you. So very important to talk about complications. I'll enlarge those numbers for you too. You can see at the far right that in patients who were not defined to have lung cancer, the complication rate was actually very low, less than a percent. 
in those who were ultimately found to have lung cancer. It was real, but at a rate that I would consider quite reasonable for a population whose life might be saved and who likely would have gone down the same path at some later point regardless. So I think from a complication perspective, I don't see any caveats that I need to share with you, but there's more. These are physical complications. Anyone who's ever been through lung cancer or been through with a loved one can tell you that anxiety can be tremendous. We've heard the term scanxiety on cancer grace. I can only imagine what it's like to be in a state where you think you may have cancer, and this study didn't address that at all. We've been talking a lot about the late effects of radiation. That wasn't measured at all. And I will leave to others who are more expert on the subject the question of financial costs both to individual patient and to society. I will address these last two bullet points, two basic ideas that, to my mind, challenge a bit whether in the real world we'll see as much benefit as this study claims. First is the issue of the imaging. While the study was being conducted, CT scanning advanced. If you want to be optimistic, we may detect more cancers with the more advanced imaging. And if you want to be pessimistic, we may detect more things, radiographic abnormalities, white spots, what I sometimes call ditzels, that'll never turn into cancer. And as a consequence of finding those, we may push up this complication rate, both the financial expense and the complications rates this patient suffer from as a result of screening. More importantly, though, in my mind, is the radiologist. All of the radiologists who read the scans in the study were dedicated academic radiologists in a major center. Such a person undergoes additional training after finishing their general radiology residency. They have specific thoracic radiology training. And there are also people who, after that training, spend all day looking at chest CT scans, as opposed to looking at some of those and some liver scans and some brain scans and other things, as a good community radiologist does. If the expertise brought to bear to the films in the community is a bit lower, we may have more false positives and we may have more lung cancers missed. Equally important is the surgical expertise. In general, when you screen for something, you do a lot more benefit to patients if you can actually do something about finding the cancers. In this case, the doing something is surgery that's hopefully curative. In the real world, in the United States, the mortality on the table for thoracic surgery is 4%. In this study, the surgeons were all very experienced, academic, dedicated thoracic surgeons, and their mortality rate was only 1%. That's a huge difference, and it's relevant in and of itself that less mortality on the table is good, but it's also important in that that mortality on the table may also be a surrogate for surgical quality. And so these better surgeons may also be doing a better job at curing the cancer. And so if the efficacy of the thoracic surgery goes down, that 20% survival advantage that we saw in this study may shrink in the real world. And to shift gears a little bit, and talk about perhaps my favorite topic in all of thoracic oncology, which is the elderly. There has been a raging controversy about how to treat in the first line the incurable elderly functional patient with lung cancer. For a long time, a lot of the world didn't give the functional elderly chemotherapy at all. They felt that while chemo may help younger patients, they feared that older patients couldn't tolerate it that even the most functional elderly would get too many side effects and you would hurt them more than help them. So hospice, supportive care only, was the standard of care for many oncologists for the elderly. Enter a study that's one of my favorite studies and also my favorite name study, the Elvis study. And Elvis showed that chemo was king of the hill for the elderly. Elvis randomized elderly patients to single agent chemo versus no chemo and showed that chemo benefited the elderly. Well, since then, we've had some debate. Should the elderly get just one drug or should the elderly get two drugs like younger patients? We've shown more than once that younger patients benefit more from doublet or two-agent chemotherapy incorporating a platinum drug than they do from a single agent. And when we've gone back and done that subgroup analysis that I've said is a lower level of data, our results thus far have shown us that the elderly seem to derive about as much benefit from the addition of that platinum drug as younger patients. But there have been many skeptics. There have been many very talented, very famous thoracic oncologists who continue to give single agent therapy to the functional elderly because they really fear that they're going to hurt their older patients with the two drugs. Whereas there have been other camps, including my mentor, who've argued for years that the retrospective data speaks loudly and the absence of data speaking otherwise that we should treat the functional elderly just as we treat younger patients. 
And so the French finally adjudicated for us. This was a French trial. Dr. Kwa was the first author. And she randomized, I think, a very well-designed study. The two arms in the single-agent arm, elderly patients got the two drugs that I think are in most popular use for the elderly, the well-tolerated single-agent drugs, navalbine or gemcitabine, versus a specific doublet regimen that many of us have liked for a long time for the elderly. This was piloted by Chandra Balani. And what's nice about the regimen is that instead of giving all of the drugs all at once, he divided up the taxol. So instead of getting it all on day one, it was divided between days one, eight, and 15. So three weeks in a row, the fourth week off. And what's great about this regimen from more of a common sense standpoint is that you can modulate your doses based on how the patient is doing. Some functional elderly patients tolerate chemo like you're giving them a glass of water and benefit every bit as much as younger patients. Well, if your 80-year-old patient hardly knows you're giving her chemo, you can keep steaming full steam ahead on day 8 and 15. On the other hand, if your patient's starting to get into trouble, either they're not feeling well or their counts aren't so good, you can sit down with them and talk and you can make a judgment. And you can either hold the day 8 or 15 or you can modify the dose downward. This was a good study in that it took the single agent regimens that people in the real world were arguing for the elderly and randomized it against a very elderly friendly doublet regimen. It was also well designed in that everyone got the same second line therapy after. So it really was a very good test of two agent therapy in the first line versus one. Here are the core results, both for progression free survival and overall survival. You see a very clinically real and important advantage to the doublet regimen. And as well, this is statistically significant. So I keep my promises. I promised both some good personal news and I promised a song. I'm reaching you not from my home in North Carolina right now, but from my grandmother's house in New York. And the reason I'm in New York is to shop for an engagement ring because while away on vacation, I asked my girlfriend Sarah to marry me and for some crazy reason she accepted. Just after I got back and I was on a high from this, in a very good mood, she and I were working at our desks over the weekend and I had a glass of wine and Frank Sinatra was playing in the background and I got distracted from my work and wrote a song about our best advances of 2011, which, as I promised, I will share with you. When I was 33, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for 15-pack years and age 55. We'd screen with CT. We'd do it three times. And we would save some lives. When Jack was 43, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for Adeno with Alc rearranged. We'd treat it with Chris. Then we'd look to HSP. And then we'd have PEM. But now the days grow short. You're in the autumn of your years. You're fit and you're strong and you want chemo just like your younger peers. Not just one drug you want to. So it can be a very good year. Well, I thank you for your attention, and I'll happily take any questions you have. We'll continue with the question and answer session in the next podcast. 